Well, he sure is curious. Yeah, he's smelling the back up. Puck is 33 yes. inches, 33 inches. Um, he was the first horse we got. He turned eight on May 5th. So I use him to remember how long I've been married to Brenda. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's sad, but we were married in May, um, eight years ago. So. Puck was born just before we got married, and then we bought Puck, I don't know, when he was... A year, well, he was Five a months, six months. And we got him in know. February. Whatever, I don't know. We bought him, and then we went and picked him up. I don't know how long after we bought him, but... Um, so he's the one who started it all, and right now, Brenda's taking out his winter coat he uh i guess we'll address that first he's a roan um so you can see he's got a really pretty gold coat under there and it's a nice deep dark gold and um he looks fantastic with it and uh he's a palomino so that's red with, cream. with a cream and, but then he has a roan, which uh, turns your hair white. And it's mostly on the body, and it stops at the, the hocks and the knees, and usually right at the cheek. And uh, so he'll roan out in the late fall for the winter time. And does he do it again? Well, it's kind <laughs> of roan is does kind it? of interesting. It's uh, the hair grows in the color that he normally is, his base color. And then as the season progresses, more white hairs grow in. So later in the season, he'll get lighter and lighter and lighter. And then when the seasons change, when he needs to start to grow his winter coat, the coat grows in gold and the undercoat starts growing in white. And when he starts shedding out the winter coat, then he loses all the gold hairs and he's mostly white. Um, and then in the summer he starts over with this dark gold and then as the summer progresses he grows in more and more white hairs. So it's kind of a, you know, he goes from dark gold to light gold to white to dark gold to light gold to white. It's, it's a constantly changing horse of many colors. So, I mean, and Rome does that too, you know, all horses that are Rome. But, oh. Have to be lower. Yes, you do. Um, all right, so he's the first one who started it. Um, another gene. Yeah, he's. <laughs> there is, there's a mare that he shares the fence with that's in heat chili, so. <laughs> he's like, let me out. I want after her. Another thing that was uh, interesting, we thought he was a buckskin when we first got him. Silver buckskin. Silver buckskin, because he has black points down here um, on his fetlocks. Hi. On his Thank knees. Thank you, and his knees. And he also has a lot of black in his tail. And yeah, you can see in his tail it's black. And so we thought he was a buckskin with the silver gene, and the silver would then turn his mane white. And um, so for the longest time we thought he was a buckskin with silver because of the black because you normally don't get black with the palomino because they're red and there is no black at all it's it's just not possible with the black it covers all the red um yeah the black is a dominant uh color and well he's just recessive red yeah he's uh, as far as the genes you've got black and red and uh, black is dominant so if you have one black and one red red gene it shows black because black is dominant so it will cover all red so to have a red horse you have to have both um, recessive genes which are red so you have to have red red 
to have a red horse, and so they won't have any black at all. So when we saw the black, we thought he was a buckskin, which is a black horse with cream, right. but he's a red horse with cream, and what brought on the black gene, um, which we... <laughs> well, it's not, it's more of a color factor, it's uh, another or gene. Yeah, we'll it's another gene that uh, it modifies horse color. And uh, there isn't a test for it, but it's called the sooty factor. And uh, what it does is it affects the horses of any color, any color except for grays, because gray, is, any white color really kind of goes over any well, pigmented we'll color. That later, but but um, yeah, it's the sooty factor will affect any color of horse, and it, it affects the the face, the points, usually the knees and then the body. It, and it almost uh, does the seasonal change too. As he roams out, he gets more sooty too. And it, it, it's quite interesting. We have some pictures where he looks almost like he's a, like a dark brown, but it has the roan in it too. And, and it's like three different colors of hair in his coat. So I, one year called him the Richard Gear of horses because he had all this salt and pepper going on. <laughs> so one year he bred with Shelby and she came into foal and uh, she had the foal but Brenda and I were both gone and had the foal. The foal died um, just after it was born. So it was a buckskin and Brenda decided to have Puck tested to see what the chances were to have another buckskin and found out that I know, I know, yeah. To see what the chances were of uh, getting another buckskin. of having another buckskin. And that's how we found out that he was a palomino instead of a buckskin. So then she wanted to find out why he has black and that's when I tested him for silver. When she tested him for silver. And he came back negative. And so then had to assume he had sooty. Um, well, actually, I tested him for silver first. Oh. I, I'm remembering this now. But um, I tested him for silver first because I wanted to know what my chances were of uh, avoiding the silver gene. Well, obviously, it's 50-50, but I just wanted to know my chances of getting a buckskin without the silver gene. And uh, when he came back negative for silver, I was like, what? Hold on. Then why does he look the way he does um, if he's not carrying silver? And so we tested him for black, and he came back negative for black. And that determined that he was a palomino. Um, so there's that. OK. So kind of the story of Puck was we got him. Um, Brenda had always wanted a horse. So I said, all right, sure, why not? We get a horse. Neither of us had ever owned a horse. We weren't really prepared. <laughs> we weren't really horse people. We were stupid and just went for it. Um, we got him. My parents let me keep him in their yard until my neighbor, who had a small one-acre orchard, let us keep him there. And so we moved him into the orchard, and he grew up there um, as we slowly learned more about horses. Um, he was almost gelded, but when the vet came out, it was a, a rainy day. And so the vet said, I don't like to geld horses on when the weather's bad, it's rough on them. So we decided not to geld him at all. And because uh, I was an idiot and sentimental. Um, <laughs> and then another kind of an odd thing about him was we talked about removing his wolf teeth. Uh, stallions grow what are called wolf teeth, where it's a, a lower canine. Um, and basically all it's good for is fighting. Um, there is no other real purpose because it's a pointed tooth in the lower jaw. There isn't another one up top. It's not good for grinding. He's a handful. <laughs> I do work with him, but he just doesn't ever slow down. Um, so the vet checked for his wolf teeth, and he didn't have any wolf teeth. Um, about 
three or four years later, uh, I was giving him a wormer and put my hand in his jaw to open it up and slid it in and he bit down and his wolf teeth crushed my thumb and uh, so he was kind of weird and he grew his wolf teeth in way too late. So that was kind of an interesting thing about him. Um, he's different from other horses. Is there a question? Oh, no. Okay. He's different from other horses in that he'll run from dogs for a short period of time and then he turns and he attacks dogs. Uh, this came from when he was in the orchard and some neighbor, neighbor's Weimar honors got out and jumped the fence and got in with him when he was uh, about a year and a half and they chased him around and there were two of them so they chased him for a while and for some reason he turned and started to run after one of the dogs then the other dog would run after him and they kind of went back and forth and so since then he's been really aggressive towards dogs. Uh, Frank, when he was a puppy, made the mistake of trying to get in with him and Puck picked him up and threw him. And so he's more like a mule or a donkey when it comes to, <laughs> to uh, dogs. His personality, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's trained to drive. I spent a while and trained him to drive. We have a cart for him. Um, even driving doesn't slow him down or wear him down. It's frustrating. It's just full of energy. But uh, that was a lot of fun and interesting to train him to drive. Um, he didn't take to the bit very well. He would use it, but at about 45 minutes, he just stopped and stood there and wouldn't move. Um, after doing that several times, we ended up going over to a bitless bridle and uh, he works with that just fine and doesn't care. Um, so we've just stuck with that and really haven't gone over to a, a bit since then. Um, brilliant. Fight this concrete. <laughs> Let's see, uh, what else? He learned in the orchard how to rear up and walk on his hind feet to get apples from trees. Um, he first started eating the low hanging fruit and then as it got higher and higher, he'd rear up to pull it down, and then he got to the point where he could walk on his hind feet to stay up longer to grab the fruit and pull it down. So he's talented in that respect. Um, what else have we gone through with him? <laughs> um, well, he did run away once. <laughs> yeah, he escaped once and ran away, and our neighbor came back with him tied to the back of their truck. Well, they were leading him with their truck. <laughs> um, normally he would just run, like, he uh, took every chance he got, basically, to break away from us, uh, run down the street, eat the, eat the neighbor's tulips. But um, one day we had him uh, sort of staked out in our front yard, and we don't know how he got untied, um, because we have, we use a specific knot that you would have to untie it manually. The horse can't do it himself. And that was the day that he miraculously was on an adventure running down the streets. And we think that someone might have untied him um, when we weren't watching. So uh, yeah, we, we learned a lot with Puck because we learned what not to do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, made a lot of mistakes with him, but he's still here, so that's nice. <laughs> And he's still healthy, <laughs> and just as much of a horse as he's ever been. Um, another thing, which was another mistake we made, um, he's been in one fight with uh, Showtime, our other stallion, when we were in Oregon. He uh, was two fields away, and one, like the ribbon or the tape hot wire fence, one wire hot wire fence, and then he had to go through two gates that were open, but he'd have to run through them and go, I don't know, like 100 yards or so to get to them and down a, a long driveway. For some reason, he decided to break through all of them. They were all hot, and then get into a fight where they were chasing each other, and so he broke through several fences, or 
hot wire fences, cutting himself to do it. Um, he can roll underneath paneled fences if it's more than a foot high off the ground. He's learned how to roll next to it and get his body under it enough to lift it up. And he's and, kind of an escape artist. And get under it. And uh, we have to watch him because he'll start to dig next to one if he can't get under it to where it's has a hole enough to roll under it. Yeah, he's working on his new spot right now. We have to fill it in, huh, Puck? <laughs> So that's Puck, our first horse. Um, I'll, I'm always going to keep him his whole life till he's dead, no matter what happens. And I'm, then after he's dead? And then after he's dead, I'm going to get him mounted. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he's named Puck not after hockey, but after Midsummer the character from Midsummer Night's Dream, um, which really matches his personality. Yeah, nothing, nothing <laughs> he's gotten into a lot of trouble, <laughs> so um, he's been a, a wonderful and horrible learning curve, and um, we really, really were terrible, terrible owners the first couple of years. Yeah, you have to have something to learn on, right? Yeah, <laughs> like going to somebody who knows what they're doing and working with them first, so. <laughs> he still turned out okay. He well, was wild luckily, when we first got him. So. I mean, he, he had no hands. Like, no. Yeah, he came from Barbari, which is a fantastic farm. Um, <clears throat> Aaron, Aaron Borcher from Barbari. She took over. Oh, she took over? Okay. <clears throat> well, they're a great farm, and the horses all run out on a lot of land and everything. And yeah, he was just a wild little colt, so he hadn't had much interaction with people. Had a lot of fun. And, uh,. So he's great. I'd do it again. Uh, I'd wish that I had spent a little more time learning about owning a horse. Um, I spent a lot of time around horses, but not actually owning a horse full time before I before I got him. So. But he really inspired us to learn. Yeah. Because you know he was always nipping us, and we tried everything to to get him. Basically, we just had to teach him who was boss and what our space was. Because he, he is not afraid of getting in your space. Alright, so that's the basic story on Puck. Um, if you want to know anything, go ahead and type questions. Otherwise, we're going to talk about uh, AMHA and AMHR. They're the registries. Um, the American Miniature Horse Association and American Miniature Horse Registry. Um, they're both obviously for miniature horses. <laughs> um, yeah, and Puck is only registered AMHR. Right. Um, and we're considering getting him hard shipped into AMHA. Um, AMHA's books close uh, to hard shipping in 2013, so. Is sort of do it now, or you never know when the next opportunity might come along for him to be able to be an AMHA. And he does meet the height requirements because with AMHA, you have to be 34 inches or less. AMHR, you have to be 38 inches or less. Rupak is 33, last one measure. I don't know, do you want me to measure him? Yeah, well, we can show you. Um, the AMHR, which Puck is registered in, was started by the Shetland Club. The American Shetland Pony Club. So AMHR is affiliated with... Um, yeah, AMHR was the first registry. With Shetland. And they're a lot older than AMHA. AMHR has two cla height classes. One that's 34 inches or below. That's the A class. And then one that's 30, up 34 to 38 inches. And that's the B class. And then you have AMHA, which started later, that only allows 34 inches or below. And that's it. And Puck is not registered in that. That's the one that we're planning on hard shipping him into before they close their books.
since he's below 34 inches. So here you have the official measuring stick for miniature horses. I guess it's called a, a silo stick. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a measuring stick. Uh, one of the miniature horse breeders, um, when the registries first started, invented this. So I, I guess that's why it has the name it has. Uh, um, because that, that farm name is attached to it. Um, essentially it has a, has a little level here, so you know when you're level. And this is where the horse's body goes to measure, obviously, and then you lift it to get to the height of the horse. This side is inches, and this side is centimeters. We measure in inches, of course, because it's the United States. <laughs> So, we know that you're approximately 33. Let's see if you've uh, stayed that way. Uh, it helps to measure on level ground, concrete, or very level dirt. We're you standing, might back them up a little. Yeah, we're standing on some rubber pads, so I'll get them onto uh, one. just one of them. It's still not perfectly level, but uh, then there are people who put them in their show stands where their hind legs are out really far. Well, you're just supposed to get them naturally you're standing. Supposed to, yeah, I'm naturally standing so you don't change the height. Miniature horses are measured differently than they measure a normal horse. Yeah, I know. You're a real pain. Because he doesn't have a lot of show experience, uh, he's not amazing at standing still. I can drive him all day, but uh, getting him to just stand here and pose is a pain. Hey. At show time, we'll stand all day long because he's, he's a show horse. <laughs> Actually, when he's just standing in the field, he stands in his show stance. So you can see the very, very big difference between the two horses. And you want your food. All right, getting this little thing level is always tricky when the horse is moving around like crazy, but um, Puck is just shy of 33 inches, so we would measure him as a 33 inch horse um, because he's over 32 and 3 quarters and he's closer to 33. But yeah, so he's still 33 inches. We were worried for a while that he would go over, but he, uh, he never did. Talk about the different measuring? Uh, the miniature horses are measured by the last hair on their mane. You measure here versus uh, the withers where most other horses are measured. Actually, basically all other horses are measured. <laughs> but uh, the miniature horse is a height breed and uh, basically they just declared that the last hair on the mane is where they will measure the height for the miniature horses because um, well, I don't really know the reasoning behind that. I don't that know choice. why they decided. It makes the horse shorter. Um, it makes the horse sound shorter than it really is because the wither is actually a little bit higher up on the horse's body. And, um, and so I guess maybe it was just a big marketing ploy to make their horses sound smaller than they really were. And for a time there had been uh, sort of a discussion to change how the horses were measured to start measuring from the withers, but that was voted down. And I think that's because more people wanted to keep their horses in the registry and they were worried that horses would be kicked out of the registry when they changed that height measurement. Puck's being a little bit obnoxious right now, as you can see. <laughs> but um, that's how you measure a mini. I guess we can be done with Puck's little mm -hmm. <laughs> session now since his uh, patience has finally worn thin. He doesn't really have much to begin with. <laughs> yeah, that's him greeting uh, Shelby, and she's the one that's in heat. <laughs> Is there anyone with a question or anything?
we'll be bringing bringing uh, Becca and Becca and Blue. Um, that was just a rake. Sorry about that. Becca and Blue will be coming on for the remainder of the show. Um, probably do a little more halter training with Blue. Um, see how he's getting along with that. Uh, and of course, Becca will probably just eat this grass here. <laughs> I'm gonna go help Taylor. Yes, Kathleen Blue is for sale. Uh, do you want to buy them? <laughs> I know that your mom probably thinks you have enough animals, though. Uh, Taylor wanted me to... I don't know, am I still in the, the frame here? I feel weird crouching down like this, but maybe I'll do this more comfortable. Uh, Taylor wanted me to discuss a little more uh, about the miniature horses until he shows up again with Becca. Um, we talked about measuring and the heights between the different horses and how the withers are a little higher and all other horses measure by the withers. Um, other registries also measure in hands and a hand is basically four inches while miniature horses uh, measure in centimeters or inches. So when it comes to listing horses, hi Blue, for sale, I always have to convert your inches into hands and it's so funny to say, hey, my horse is only eight hands high, where other people have horses that are 14 hands. Hi, Becca, how's it going? Uh, how soon after would you uh, start halter training? A lot of people will start halter training, well, they'll put the halter on the baby right when they're born to get them used to that halter. Um, you can essentially start well, I don't know if there's really a limit on when you can start when you don't. It's just a preference. Um, I didn't start with Annie until she was much older, so she kind of didn't really like the halter, but she was so friendly that it almost seemed pointless. But um, she does need to get used to it still. So that's why <laughs> so we're starting... Pointless. She was too friendly. It didn't start early enough. <laughs> yeah, and, well, now she just doesn't like the halter, so... Um, that's why we're starting so early with Blue, uh, just to get him used to it. And he, he's not quite as friendly as Annie was when she was born. He, he's a little bit more reserved, but he's, he's definitely more friendly than the last cult that we had. Um, we decided on Blue's name because he has two blue eyes. I don't know how rare that is, but... Well, it's the first time that we've had a full born with two blue eyes. Becca and Showtime both have kind of like a speck of blue in one eye each of them. Um, so it seems like their folds have pro progressively been getting more and more blue in their eyes. I don't know why it is that way, but it's just chance. Um, the first cult that they had together had a, a small fleck of blue in his eye and it was like a partially blue eye. Then Annie was born and she had um, a one blue eye. It has a little bit of brown in it, so it's kind of the reverse. And then Blue was born and I'm like, oh, he has a blue eye. Um, and then I didn't really notice until the next day that he had two blue eyes. And so it was just really stunning to have a buckskin with blue eyes. And, and uh, I just thought I wanted to call him Blue. So I had to bring the word blue into his name somehow. 
Um, so I just called him Little Boobs Show Off the Blues because he's showing off his blue eyes. Yep, Becca, you're eating the grass just like I predicted. You don't disappoint, do you? Sorry about Pac again. He uh, went straight to the mare who's in heat. <laughs> oh, I was going to grab the halter. She's wearing a halter. No. Oh, Ooh. the new halter. Yeah. All right, um, did you talk about how most miniature horses are essentially Shetland? Uh, no. Oh, well, most miniature horses are essentially Shetlands or have uh, a lot of Shetland blood in them, like pl Puck. Um, you look in his, uh, his pedigree, and the extended pedigree, and it goes straight back to uh, Shetlands. He actually has um, registered Shetlands in his pedigree. Yeah, but, so his pedigree goes way back. Yeah, his pedigree goes back 150 years. Yeah, like the 1800s. So. Yeah, back into the 1800s. Um, but the vast majority of them are uh, Shetlands that are just can continue to be bred down and then they're breeding for more and more refinement. Um, there are other small breeds like Caspians, uh, the Falabella, which is the name of a family in Argentina, and I don't know what they bred down from. Then you obviously have the Shetlands, and uh, I don't know what other small breeds there are. Uh, there's the Caspian, but they're. I mentioned the Caspian. They're so, oh, sorry, but they're they're much bigger. But uh, yeah, they're, these are small breeds, but they're not as small as the miniatures. I think the miniatures and the Follow Bellas are the smallest. Yeah. Um, Caspians are a, a natural breed, like the Shetlands. Oh, I don't know if you can say a Shetland necessarily natural, but. Um, more natural than uh, than a miniature horse, which has been extensively bred to be this small. And Caspians come from the Caspian Sea area, and they're about the same size as a Shetland. And they're as refined as the what do they call them? The new Shetland or the modern, the modern modern Shetland, which are much more refined than the pony look of a Shetland than your standard Shetland. Oh, hi, bud. How you doing? A little bit scared. It's like I don't want this again. Oh my gosh! I thought you bought another one. No, you tied that one apparently, and I'm trying to figure out what you did. So I just tied a quick knot in it. Hi. Remember me? Um, some health problems with miniature horses. There are quite a few. Mostly, we don't run into many. Um, colic has been, you know, with any horse, is like the number one concern. With miniatures, their intestines are much smaller and uh, they're more susceptible to it. So, worming is essential. And, like we found out with Puck, uh, making sure they have plenty of water in the wintertime. Um, he had a, a sort of colic episode. I'm not sure what to call it. Yeah, he, he had dehydration colic. Basically, he didn't have, we weren't able to monitor his water intake because he was sharing a trough and um, he wasn't drinking. I assume it's because um, Shelby, she's quite a messy horse and she does get the water dirty. Um, and he probably has cleaner habits than that and didn't want to drink dirty water. That's our only, only, uh, idea behind why he wasn't drinking. Um, so with Puck we had to monitor his water intake and basically he now has um, He has a, his own bucket. Yeah, his own All, bucket. He's very picky about water and how much he drinks and in the winter time we have to be very careful about how much we have to watch how much he drinks. He's a really weird horse like that. So or maybe not weird. We, he's the only one we've had out of all the horses that we've owned that uh, won't drink water if it gets even slightly dirty. So <laughs> it's... So I'm washing his bucket out a lot. Up, up to the point where he will go without drinking water and colic. <laughs> so um, another problem is there are dwarfs in, there's a dwarf gene in miniature horses. 
Yeah, initially when they started breeding miniature horses, it almost was that they would use the dwarfs to get them down to their size. And uh, so the dwarf gene is quite prevalent. And that was before the miniature horses um, developed a strict standard of confirmation. And now dwarfs basically are not registerable and, uh, and uh, are not to be used for breeding. So they're, they're also trying to work on a genetics test to, to isolate the dwarf gene so that um, horses with the recessive dwarf gene won't be bred together. Uh, however, a lot of the miniature horses have that, so it's going to be rare to find one without and to uh, breed for horses without the dwarf gene. I'm, I'm pretty confident that Showtime has never had a dwarf foal, um, and he also throws foals that are a little taller. So like with Becca, her, her colt here is kind of topping out at uh, the, the very tallest of the A-class miniatures. But to me, that's good because it's, it says you'll know you'll have a healthy horse. Um, and, and another, uh, their teeth don't fit their mouth. <laughs> yeah, some things don't breed down with the size. Um, bone structure is one of those things uh, with the teeth. A large horse's teeth are only slightly larger than a miniature horse's teeth. So there's a lot of dental issues with miniature horses. But pretty good. It's like, oh, not this again. Yeah. So they've got uh, they nearly Shetland-sized teeth in a miniature horse mouth. And it's about half the size of the head. <laughs> um, so they can get crowded teeth more easily, and uh, they can have uh, well, the teeth might be growing, what the roots of the teeth grow into the jawbone and, and yeah, create bulges. The, yeah, they have problems with the roots and growing down. Um, they get huge bumps all along their jaws. And then their teeth, uh, they'll sublux and they turn sideways. So they have a lot of dental work on them all the time. So regular floating is preferred. Essential. <laughs> Another problem. Um, they're really, really easy to overfeed because they will try to eat like a full-sized horse and they need very little food. Um, so it's easy for people to overfeed them and for them to become obese. And then uh, once people realize they're obese, they'll cut back on their food quickly and they get, uh, I always forget, it's hyperlipidemia or hyperlipidosis. Oh, well, someone's asking about the teeth issue. Oh, um, okay. Taff would like to know if Minnie's uh, teeth at the same time as bigger horses, and as far as I know. Yeah, um, they get their teeth in rather quickly. They can actually start to eat grass in, within about a month. Um, and then you're talking about losing their decidu deciduous teeth, or? Yeah, like basically teething. Yeah. Um, he's already uh, started teething. Yeah, his deciduous uh, teeth are already coming in. You can, you see, can see them. You can see that they've erupted. And, and uh, his bite is on, <laughs> which is good. For now. <laughs> yeah, we have to keep a watch on that. That's the other thing that's related to the dwarf gene is the underbite. Um, underbite. Or overbite, overbite isn't necessarily dwarf, but underbite's more common. But, yeah, it's the same as with... Uh, with any other horses. It's, Puck was a fluke with his wolf teeth. Um, he grew them in, they just came in a lot later than they ever should have, so it was uh, like a one-time weird thing. Which reminds me, I should probably get those <laughs> removed. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we get floated. <laughs> Alright, well... And uh, the hyperlipidemia is where if they get obese and then you cut their weight quickly, um, the fat can uh, enter the bloodstream and then you can uh, essentially cause their organs to shut down and then they die. Yeah, it's just a high fat content in their bloodstream. Right? And it happens to other animals, it happens to large horses, they're just more prone to it because um, it's so easy for them to, uh, to gain weight.
because it's so simple to overfeed them. They don't. It doesn't. It doesn't take much. Becca's looking a little under, but I think that guy is the reason. <laughs> it doesn't take much. Uh, much more food to cause them to get overweight. You know, a horse only needs roughly two and a half percent um, dry weight of their own weight per day. So, if you have a 200-pound horse, it's not not a large difference in weight to cause them to become obese. Oh, um, and mares get wolf teeth. Uh, yes, that was another question. Oh. It's occasionally you will get a mare that gets wolf teeth. It's not very common. I think it, you know, there's a percentage in all horses where the mares will get them too. And then not all stallions get them. Yeah, like we thought Puck would. <laughs> hey, blue. How's it going? Hey, good boy. Yeah, oh, good boy. Don't, you know, you don't need to test out those new teeth. <laughs> <laughs> your mare does. <laughs> you th well, you'll know if your mare has them. Um, where the bit goes in the lower jaw between the, the front teeth and the hind teeth, you can slip your finger in, in the jaw, and there's this huge space that your finger can slide, and there's absolutely nothing but just jaw on the lower jaw. And um, the wolf teeth tooth sits right in there and it's a spike and so you'll know when you try to slide your finger in there and slide back and forth you'll run into a tooth that just stip, sits in there like one big giant spike it's a canine tooth and so uh, you'll know if it's if it's there it's in the same spot that the bit rests and slides back and forth licking my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't turn that into nipping, okay? Because nipping is not good. You probably will. <laughs> That's the next progressive step. Those boys are trouble. Boys are trouble. Okay, the stockings and socks. What are the difference because people say different things? No, oh, that's a good question. I don't really pay attention to, this, to the legs a whole lot. Um, a stocking is normally just a high sock, like a high white. Um, so here, blue, you won't be able to see very well because his coat's so light. Come here, blue. Let's use these as an example. Mm, probably be easier on. Well, that guy does too on her hind side. Like that would be a this sock. This would be a sock. So and this would be a sock. Here, so. let's show on Becca. All right. Here's Becca. I'm sorry. So she has white that comes up to right behind the knee. It's kind of starting mid shin. This would be a sock because um, it doesn't go past this joint. And then you get along here, and you see the white comes past your hock. And this would be a stocking because it has a higher white. And that's basically my interpretation of it. Um, I have to write it down for the registration papers because they want to know about the, uh, about the whites on their legs and, and to identify them. Um, so I'm always looking it up because I'm like, oh gosh, what's that called again? And um, There's just a different term for almost everything. You know, the, if the white doesn't even go past the uh, fetlock very much, it's, it has a different name. Um, it, I don't like all the names that are that have been come up with in the horse world from a couple hundred years ago. They don't make <laughs> sense to me half the time, so I don't like them. Taylor likes the genotype names. He doesn't yeah. like phenotype. Phenotype is basically what it looks like, or genotype is what, genetically what it's coded yeah, genetically to Genetically <laughs> what it is, where phenotype is people just give it a name because it looks like something. I'm all about science. <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. I'm going to scare you. How long does the genetic testing take? Um, 
Well, Moonchild, uh, it can take uh, as long as a week. It mostly depends on the mail time. Um, I haven't sent off Blue's genetic test. We, we pulled samples from him on Friday, but we're still working out the printer issue, and I'm going to end up printing up the form um, and then mailing it off on Monday. But usually the, the courier time is the longest time you have to wait. Once it gets to the lab, the genetics, genetic test can be done in as little as a day. They, they tend to say you can wait up to five days once it gets there, but they have usually been able to turn it around rather quickly. And, uh, and they email you the results. And yeah, you'll get the results by email. And then they also mail you a certificate after that um, if you request it. And uh, so it can take as little as a week, as long as two weeks, depending on the mailing time. And so it's hard to wait, though, when you really want to know. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Um, I don't know if we really have anything more. Uh, we can just answer any more answer questions. Questions or leave these guys to. Yeah, we can just leave these guys in here for you to watch for the next little while. We have to go meet up with family. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, my mother's come down to go shopping, and I was going to meet up with her for lunch. It's real late lunch, but we wanted to do the Becca show so everyone could enjoy it today. And it's a beautiful day here in eastern Washington. The sun's shining, the wind's not blowing like crazy, so it's a nice day to get outside and and have a happy Mother's Day. Relax. Uh, lethal white, lethal white overo gene. That's what L L W O stands for. It's uh doesn't always come in overos. Well, overo is kind of a phenotype um, and genotype. Uh, there, there's a gene for overo, there's a gene for lethal white overo. You can get, and it's kind of complicated. I don't breed for overo, so I'm not exactly an expert with it. I breed for Tobiano, and I have some, uh, I guess it's Sabino, Sabiano, or I don't know how to pronounce the other one. That's Sabiano. Kind of, it's mixed in with my Tobiano as well because it's really it's quite common in Tobianos. It's mostly the face white and then sometimes gives you a little bit of roaming on the body too. Um, Overo it gives you a different pattern. It's mostly like it's it's white mostly on the face and gives you high whites on the, the legs and sometimes you get a little white on the body but it tends to not break over the top. That's what I think anyway. I'm not exactly sure. There's reverse overos as well, where the the body color is in the in the reverse spot from the white. And overo is very complex to me. So I mean, I'm not an expert. But the lethal white overo gene is tied to the overo. Um, not all overos have it. Uh, so you test for the lethal white to so make sure that you're not breeding to another lethal white to to cause uh, a lethal white foal. Um, and that's unfortunate when you get one because they don't survive very long. And it's recessive, so you have to have both. You have to have lethal white twice. Um, yeah. If they only have one, they won't die. So they have to have it from both parents. Um, which, it's nice that it's recessive because technically they can breed it out and completely remove it if everyone tested for it before they bred. But, you know, that's a massive uh, undertaking and no one's going to be willing to, you know, you have to get every single breeder willing to do that and it's just never going to happen. Um, the reason why we got into minis is because, well, uh, I wanted to start by getting a horse. I thought, hey, I'll start by getting a small one and minis are cute. Um, we, I mean, Puck was basically our experiment, but um, like they say, minis are like potato chips and you can't just have one. Um, you get addicted rather easily. They're easy to take care of. Care of um, they don't eat as much as a large horse, and so you can have more of them on a smaller area. And it's kind of like you get pleasure from them the same as you would a large horse. You can't ride them, 
but you can drive them in a cart, and that can be just as fun. Um, plus, they're less intimidating and less dangerous than a large horse. Um, I still would like to get a large horse, but... Uh, but they're dangerous in teaching you bad habits if you're going to be around a large horse. What, you're talking about minis teaching us bad habits? Yes, yeah, anyone who owns a miniature horse, they're dangerous in teaching you bad habits if you're going to be around a large horse. You have to be careful in how you behave and what you do if you're going to own or be around miniature horses because they can teach you bad habits in how you, uh, yeah, how you handle them and how you're around them because if you do... Yeah, if minis, you do it incorrectly and then you apply the same thing with a large horse, you can get injured easily. Yeah, minis, uh, you, you get spoiled because you can manhandle them a whole lot easier. You can use your body to, um, to persuade them um, versus a large horse, they can just run you over. But um, I started with minis mostly because they were less intimidating and uh, I thought they were cute. Um, what you do with miniatures, you know, you can show them you can drive them, um, they're, you know, the uses are limited, but, you know, they, they give me a lot of pleasure being just pets. Uh, you know, when people ask me, what do you do with a miniature horse, I say, well, what do you do with a dog? It's essentially the same. Um, obviously, they don't come when you call them necessarily because they have different motives, but... Um, they come to a carrot. Yeah, Becca <laughs> will come to a carrot, and they greet you, and it's just a different type of love, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They, they don't have that pack mentality to where they have to be with you, but they're more independent. And uh, it's just, you know, just another animal to appreciate. Um, and it satisfies that horsey drive where I, I've always wanted to have a horse, but um, they aren't going to turn around and kill me one day by, like, throwing me from a saddle. That's, a, that's always a plus. I do have... Or, or striking you. I've got a video of Puck hitting me in the face and, yes, and that's all it did when we, was give me a black eye. That's when we learned that you shouldn't teach them to rear. Uh, <laughs> that was another mistake. We didn't teach him. He learned yeah. <laughs> on his own in the But orchard, we gave but... him a cue and he knew the cue to rear. Yeah. Like I said, you learn bad habits with a miniature horse, so... <laughs> um, you can go into trick training large horses, but you know, obviously you have to have a lot of uh, experience with horses before you do that. <laughs> yeah, Puck used to rear so much that he had so much strength to be able to walk on his back legs. So, um, Taff, when it comes to getting him to go down, you have to really yank on that halter. <laughs> or keep him down, don't let him up. I, what I used to do is I'd get him off balance. So if he tried to rear at me, I would uh, basically push his neck to one side and then he had to go down because he can balance forward to back, but he had a lot harder time when it came to being pushed off to the side. So that was basically my tactic when it came to preventing Puck from rearing after we had trained him to rear. So he doesn't really rear at us anymore. And when he does start, you know, I can see the look in his eye, I will push his neck aside and it kind of prevents him from even doing it anymore. Hi, Gidget Pony. <laughs> I don't really know how to stop a miniature horse from rolling on you. You just get out of the way. <laughs> rolling? Rolling. Yeah. Once You're they not have an stop itch. It. Once they have an itch, they're just gonna do it. Puck has tried to roll when he was in the cart. Um, at least the cart stopped him. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, he went and he got down on his legs and tried to roll and he couldn't do it. And yeah. He tried to stand up and had a hard time. Yeah, he just like, oh, okay, that didn't work out too well. But rolling when he had the harness on was another story, so. <laughs> well, yeah, he used to sit on Taylor's lap when he was little. Taylor used to nap with Puck. Mm -hmm. Puck was a good pillow then, get you pony. <laughs> um, when we'd stake him out, he would sometimes get tangled up, like I said, when we were idiots. Um, and when he'd get tangled up, he would, uh, he figured out how to get untangled on his own. And if it was so bad, he would just end up lying down and just lay there and wait till somebody came instead of, uh, instead of freaking out like some horses will do and getting injured. So 
we got really, really lucky there. Um, usually a horse rolls for a various number of reasons. Kathleen wants to know why they roll. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> they could have an itch. Uh, they could be wet and not like being wet, so they'll roll Taking to the, they'll roll to uh, get the water off. <laughs> Um, supposed to give them a kind of a coating to help a dust them, coating yeah from insects, uh, insects. yeah it's, it's sort of a natural repellent getting dirt on them um, they they roll just to be a horse I don't really know the they know the answer but um, that's why in a lot of pastures you'll see like a dust bowl and, uh, that the horses go to just to roll it's sort of just part of their ritual to... Yeah, from what I've read, it's supposed to be the equivalent of a bath. Yeah, dust bath. Um, to control frizz in the main taff? Uh, that is a very good question, because I know that in my, in my hunting for perfect miniature horses for my breeding program and, and for my own taste... Wait, is she talking about genetically, yes. or is she talking about just when they've been out forever and you haven't brushed it and they're rolling. Uh, she's just talking about frizz in the main, like afros. <laughs> we had a horse Lock. with an afro once. Basically, when they get them ready for shows, they will trim the underside of the mane and get rid of half of the, the width of the mane, so that reduces the amount of hair to deal with. And then they will brush it and put in a gel to try and get it as straight as possible. Um, you might as well get in some beauty elements while you're at it. I would get a flat iron out and try and iron the hair as much as possible. Um, it's essentially like people hair, but much, much coarser. So you're dealing, you're going to deal with a lot uh, more challenges when it comes to uh, straightening that hair. Uh, <laughs> I try to stay away from horses with the, the big poofy manes because I really like the, the wild look of the straighter hair. Puck has straight hair and um, Showtime has really straight hair. Uh, Shelby has really, really slick hair. She has a single coat, doesn't yeah, even have, she doesn't the even have coat. a double coat. And so her hair is kind of what I'd like to see more and more in my horses, but uh, it's really rare to find a single coat uh, miniature horse. Um, and we're trying to get her into foal, but she's been um, not successful ever since 2007. So it's been a, sort of a challenge with her. We're trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, but yeah, the, the frizzy mane and tail is just essentially using a lot of gel, heat, and beauty supplies and, and different methods like you know trimming underneath the mane to get rid of some of it and then um, trimming away a lot of the, the hair in the bridle path and then trimming around the, the forelock to get to reduce the amount and then they just gel it up um, and I know that a lot of the I know that white hair frizz is less than dark, the black hair so you'll you'll see sorrels uh, palominos and and uh, any horse with lighter colored hair will have less frizz problems than a horse with black hair um, black hair is a bigger hair follicle um, because the pigment takes up more space and so that hair shaft is going to be thicker and harder to deal with. Good. Good. Yeah. Cowboy magic on dealing with mane and tails. I haven't tried cowboy magic, but maybe I, I will. I mean, Becca has... You've done mane and... Tail, well, that's it? just a shampoo. Oh. Um, well, maybe cowboy magic. Is that a shampoo? I haven't. I just sort of stick to what I've got because I buy in bulk and then I don't look for a long like time. It's like one of those shine conditioner things that stays in and keeps it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I use a different shine conditioner. Um, it's probably not cowboy magic though. <laughs> it's not cowboy magic. Go out one day when you're willing to test it and have them roll about five minutes later. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Um. You're doing so well. Yes, you are. About one inch. One inch. Well, the show is only supposed to be until 2 p.m. 
apparently we've gone a little over, but we did start a little late, so. Yeah, essentially you just try a bunch of different products to, to go on your minis. Um, Becca is the one with the frizziest mane that we have, and, and I just tend to try to brush it out, and, and hers isn't that bad. That sort of concludes our show. I will stick around and answer some questions. I, I do have to go off and have lunch with my mom. Wish her a happy mom's day. Thanks, Becca. She's doing so well. And then Becca just stands in the way. No, no, she stepped on the edge of the concrete. Oh. I've got it. Yeah. Oh, very good. Thank you. So good. And where it'll turn towards me, it won't quite walk to me, but it'll turn. Yeah, dead straight compared to afro hair is mostly a genetic thing. You'll you'll see it in different horses, how one horse has really slick, beautiful flowing hair, and then you'll see another horse with poofy hair. Um, and most of the Shetlands have the afro. Yeah, you'll see a lot of ponies have that denser curly hair because it was, it's that way to keep them warmer, holds air closer to the body, prevents it from blowing away and, and cooling off the horse. So a, a lot of ponies will have that to keep them warmer. The smaller the body mass, um, the more essential that is. Uh, in the environment they live in. Yeah, in the environment they live in. So, you know, Shelby would not survive in the, the Shetland Isles. <laughs> She has trouble with insects too because of her coat. Yeah, she's very sensitive. She has sensitive skin. Oh, very good. Very good. Thank you. Let's take this off on that note. All right, well. Thanks for coming to the show. We'll leave Becca and Blue out here. Um, we'll go back and chat with you guys if you have any more questions. Um, but I'm going to sort of wrap it up here, and and we'll see everyone on Friday. There, there is a chance, however, Taylor's trying to convince me just to do this once a week. Um, so we might just do it on Sundays from now on. Uh, so you guys can email us or let us know what your thoughts are if you. If you have an idea for a show that will help us out, come up with more subjects for us to talk about um, uh, so that we can continue doing it twice a week. Um, Taylor's game for whatever. Uh, <laughs> we will be um, canceling the show while Classy is in full. I mean, think that she's going to have a baby soon. I'm thinking that's why she's so fat. So <laughs> we're hoping that we're going to have another full. And we won't be renaming the Becca show. It will just be Classy instead of Becca. Um, and you'll just have to log in and, and watch Classy. So um, I'm going to go in and, and stop the recording now. So thank you for watching the show.